public session for a moment. As we're now, we're now in public session, as we now have a quorum, I call the meeting to order. Apologies have been received uh, from Deputy Butler and uh, the substitute is Deputy Frank O'Rourke, from Deputy O'Brien and the substitute is Deputy Quinlevin. Uh, um, and obviously replacement uh, for Deputy Catherine Byrne will be Deputy Colin Brophy and Deputy uh, Moran is replacing Deputy Canny. Um, at the outset, colleagues, uh, just the, the mobile phones, if you wouldn't mind either switching them off or to flight mode, uh, as the proceedings are both broadcast and recorded. In accordance with standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedure and Privileges for Paper Committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I propose now that we go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? Uh, good morning, and Mr. Jordan, you're welcome. Just before we commence, I need to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, when par where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening sub statements submitted uh, to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd like to welcome Threshold uh, to this morning's meeting, represented by Mr. Uh, Bob Jordan. The full submission from Threshold has been made available to members and at this stage Mr Jordan if you'd like to summarise that submission and then colleagues will, I'm sure will have a number of questions for you. Thank you Chairman, thank you members of the committee. Um, delighted to be here today um, and obviously um, just to say that our chairperson Dr Aideen Hayden sends her apologies and wish, you know, wishes you well in your deliberations. Obviously she's a, a strong advocate for reforms in the private rental sector that I'm going to talk about today. Um, just to say that one in five households now live in the private rented sector. It's the second largest housing tenure um, after uh, owner occupation, but it's also at the moment the biggest single cause of homelessness. I suppose I should declare my own interest in the private rented sector. I'm a tenant myself. I've lived in the same apartment, in the same building, with the same landlord for over 20 years. So. I suppose, and throughout that time, my property has been upgraded, my rent has gone up and down, we've got older together. But just to say that there are lots of people like me in the private rented sector who have a good experience, uh, and that's based on their relationship with their landlord. Unfortunately, in my day job, I'm the chief executive of Threshold, and I suppose what we've seen over the last couple of years is we see ourselves, I suppose, standing between tenants with severe housing problems and homelessness. Uh, last year we helped over 32,000 people with housing problems, about 20% of them were at immediate risk of homelessness. Uh, clearly every single one of those people represents a family crisis behind a closed door. Uh, they need support from an organisation like ourselves and I suppose one of the things that we've been able to do in the last couple of years uh, with, in collaboration with the Department of Social Protection and the local authorities is actually give people additional money under the rent supplement scheme to keep them in their homes. Clearly that's working and needs to continue. Um, I suppose one of the things that, um, that's really important about the private rented sector is that uh, it hasn't grown up uh, despite expanding in size. Um, many of our recommendations, I suppose, are related, related to giving people more protection in their homes, improved standard accommodation, uh, dealing with things like illegal evictions. I think all of you here uh, know people who live in the private rented sector, and what you wish for them is that they, they would know how long they could stay in the rented sector, how much they're going to pay from year to year, who to turn to when something is wrong with the property. Uh, these are simple things, uh, but when it comes to policy, they've been pretty fraught. Um, and it's time to deal with them. Um, back in 1999-2000, there was a commission on the private rented sector. Uh, 
there's probably less copies of this report now than original copies of Magna Carta, okay, but um, I think it would be important that every member of the committee gets a copy of this, because a lot of thinking around the private rented sector went on over 16 years ago when this report was being formulated. And some of the things that we're proposing today, like we're talking about rent certainty, uh, talking about giving t people indefinite tenancies in the private rented sector, are actually included in this report. Um, so this is Threshold's kind of minority report within the Commission report, and I'll just read part of it. Threshold opposes the Commission recommendation that rents applicable to tenancies in the private rented sector should be open market rents. While accepting the position that initial rents should be freely negotiated between tenants and landlords, Threshold is of the view that the later evolution of those rents should be based on an annual index. That was in that report. It was rejected. Uh, on the same page, Threshold is of the view that tenants should have a continuous conditional right to occupy their rented home and that it should not be subject to any upper time limit. As you know, the upper time limit that was introduced was four years. So what I'm saying is that Threshold has been totally consistent in what we've been looking for for the private rented sector. And despite what has been said sometimes in the media, there have been, our, you know, our responses are not knee-jerk. They're based on what's best for the private rented sector. That's why I think it's very important that members of this committee get a copy of this report. And these are still our positions. Uh, because the private rented sector has changed. There are more and more families living in the private rented sector. What uh, a family needs to know, I mean, four-year security of tenure for a family uh, doesn't cut it when they have their children going to school for 12 or 13 years. There is no legal impediment to introducing indefinite security of tenure in the private rented sector. And we think it should be done. Uh, equally, when it comes to uh, rent certainty, as you're probably aware, last year there was quite a lot of toing and froing in relation to rent certainty. Um, rent certainty is the norm in modern developed European economies, linking rents to uh, inflation. It's what's done in most European countries in one way or another, with the exception of the UK. Um, I would like to put it on the record as well this morning just to say that it's good for landlords as well as being good for tenants, because once the Irish rented market returns to normal supply, and it will. Rents will start to fall. Rents fell by 30% in 2008-2009. The only reason that landlords did not exit the market in droves was because they were in negative equity. There was a ratchet effect. Next time they will leave. Uh, rent certainty will ensure that the rate of rent decreases are tapered over a period of time and will protect the supply in the rented sector and protect landlords. That's rarely said, but it's important to say. So basically with rent certainty, what you have is a bandwidth in which rents can go up or down. At the moment, they can go up like this and go down like this. It's not good. Um, obviously, a rent freeze was introduced. Uh, nobody has evidence really one way or the other whether that has worked. The PRTB don't because they register new tenancies. They don't measure the changes in rent between tenancies. Um, neither do Daft because obviously they're advertising new properties. Um, but I suppose based on our work we would say that it has had some effect because over last year about a thousand people came to us who were facing um, rent increases that they couldn't afford. We were able to help them to remain in their homes. Obviously, they won't be returning to us this year. So obviously, um, I suppose to summarize, I would like to say that um, we need a new commission on the private rented sector. I think we need a second commission on the private rented sector. I would like the support of the committee uh, for that uh, recommendation. I think that um, there are so many issues in relation to the private rented sector that the danger is that if we introduce piecemeal legislation that we'll get it wrong. I'm meeting with Minister Coveney tomorrow to make that recommendation. Um, obviously, there are many other issues in our report, in our submission in relation to uh, rent supplement, bed sits, um, uh, standards in the private rented sector, and I'd like to be able to address them perhaps through questions, if that was okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan, for your opening. Uh, remarks. I have a number of people, so I'll take a couple of questions together and we'll go through it like that. Uh, Deputy Jerkin. Thank you, Chairman. I want to uh, thank Mr. Jordan for coming before the committee this morning and given his obvious views. I want to congratulate uh, Threshold for the work that they have done, particularly in this specialised area of emergency housing and, and that area. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, I believe that's a, a, appropriate that a group or body or agencies are around to deal with the situation. What I disagree with them is in relation to, to, to the degree to which the rental market can be regulated to. Uh, 
any great effect insofar as the consumer is concerned. And that particular report, I'm glad to see it turning up again after all those years, because I was an opponent of its proposals at that particular time on the basis that it could never work. And unfortunately, I was right. Uh, I, the, the, I, I should mention as well, I have a declare an interest as well. I, I rented, I was renting for 10, 12 years. And I, I had a good landlord, to be fair. Wouldn't be great at doing repairs or anything like that, but good landlord. And 90% of landlords are conscientious people who, who are reasonable. But there's another group who are not. And I know that you have had, and all people on the table have had the experiences of people who, who, who give the tenant 24 hours to get out of the house. And who will say that you have all of 24 hours to leave your house. And we know that's not in, in, in line with the regulations, but it requires an intervention uh, to protect them. But we have also situations where, and we, we continue to have them, where landlords have, have, have actually e physically ejected the tenant, put them out on the side of the road, and, and left them with nothing. And that's not in accord with the law, whether we like it or we don't like it. We have other ones then who do not sign a lease and will refuse to sign a lease. And the local authority and the rent support system is, is, has a difficulty in, in, in supporting the people who don't have a lease. They shouldn't, but they do. So what, what I have to say is more of a common chairman is simply this. I believe that the only resolution to our problem now is a rapid increase in the amount of publicly built houses for local authorities, by local authorities, uh, in terms of direct build. That doesn't mean that the local authorities hire plumbers and plasters and things like that. It means that they contract them out and get them done as quickly as possible, and I think it is possible. But, and I want to finish with this one, chairman. I had some comment during the week about a reference I made last week about the cost, affordability, affordability. And affordability, for example, is as simple as this. It was always de deemed to be two and a half times the gross income of the earner. Two and a half times was the maximum tolerances that you could come up with. Well, let's suppose a person has 100,000. What's the maximum uh, uh, mortgage or equivalent in terms of rent? 250,000. That's it. And that's a long, long way away from where we are now, both in the rental market and in the purchase market. It is a long, long way away and is unsustainable. And the point I want to emphasise there is this. I have dealt with cases in the last week, since we sat here last week, where rents have increased from 900 to 1,700 to 2,000. Now, we can talk about it as long as we like, but that's the way it's going. And there's no immediate resolution unless we can, can accelerate the delivery of publicly uh, funded houses to the local, through the local authorities and eliminate this tag we have of social housing. It is local authority housing programme that's needed badly. No doubt. Um, I just want to comment. I welcome very much your, your submission and I'm deeply concerned about what is happening right now to people who have been put out of rented accommodation. I think we have something like 80 families a week on the road and it's an appalling disgrace to our society that this very day we have homeless children being put in adult hostels on blown up beds. That is an appalling vista and obviously clearly it needs urgent and immediate action. I think one we need to, if in, as an exceptional matter, we need to, I think, communicate with the Minister urgently about this issue to take whatever steps are necessary and to deal with, obviously, the views of different organisations who are commenting on this absolute scandal. Uh, one of them, in my view, would be to, uh, you know, to commandeer hotel rooms or any available space. It is unacceptable to have children sleeping, as I understand it, in staff rooms belong so that they are safer than they are in, in, in other rooms. That is absolutely appalling. Um, and I think that we have to deal with it as a committee, make our recommendations. The other point I'd like to make is that why are people, why are there 80 families going out? Because the landlords can say, the law allows them, if I'm going to sell the accommodation, then out you go and you have three months. Now I accept that Minister Kelly in one of his last acts was, he makes this, the obligations now on the landlord to sign a statutory declaration that it is intent to sell the house. But I think we need emergency legislation, Chairman, 
absolutely immediately to, 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 to not allow that to happen in future and that nobody, for a period of a year or whatever the period is, for two years, that people cannot be put out of their accommodation full stop if they're paying the rent. And if they're not paying the rent, they go to arbitration. We cannot accept that families are being put out on the streets of our cities and our towns by callous and cowardly landlords who are abusing, abusing a situation. They're exploiting the market. They're looking for people who will pay more. And they're creating absolutely you know, appalling conditions for families. And I feel very strongly about this. And uh, the other point I would like to say, the only solution, and I agree with my colleague, Deputy Dorkin, there is seriously an amiss in the question of affordable housing. But the scandal of councils refusing to accept houses from NAMA in this city is another disgrace. Uh, and thousands of houses have been offered to county councils up and down the country. They have not taken them. They are, they are failing in their statutory duty of care, in my view, uh, to, to, to their, to their prospective tenants. But I think we should also insist that, and I know that we'd be pushing an open door, that the rapid build housing, which some of us have gone and seen in, 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 in Ballymon, to me, is an immediate urgent solution which can meet the needs of thousands of families in a very short period of time. And I think that, that is what we have to do. And Chairman, I would urge, and I appreciate I'm just speaking for myself, that this committee would urgently, that you would be delegated to see and meet with the Minister urgently about those two issues and to do it today, because we cannot allow this to continue. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Wallace, and then I'll come back to you, Mr Jordan. Uh, thank you, Hilo. Uh, thanks for coming in, uh, Bob. Um, yeah, listen, uh, in, I suppose... Um, what I want to ask now has been, has been uh, influenced by what I just heard from the other two deputies. Uh, I think we, everyone agrees we need to build more social houses and true local authorities. But I think we must also accept that uh, there is always going to be people who want to live in the private rental sector. And uh, we know that lack, the, the lack of regulation uh, has failed, leading it to the markets has failed. And I'm wondering, Bob, how, what, have you any recommendations as to how we would um, tackle rent, rent certainty uh, in the short term. We realise that the market is, uh, the, the housing uh, supply and every, every, just about every dimension of it at the moment is dysfunctional. Uh, so we're having to actually do something uh, in a dysfunctional uh, market. We're, we're not trying to do something uh, in, in, a, in a regular uh, situation. So I'm wondering um, what ideas you might have as to how we would uh, make rental properties, private rental properties, affordable again. We're at a high point at the moment, so how do you deal with that? Uh, can we get it down in the short term? And, uh, and how would you... Um, move now to actually um, try and introduce measures where rent certainty can definitely be uh, uh, expected across the board. Um, with regard to the point about local authorities and uh, uh, a disgrace that they didn't take on NAMA's offerings, I'd just like to make the point that a lot of what the NAMA offered the local authorities wasn't fit for purpose. And I would also say it was an awful pity that uh, the local authorities didn't have a peak, a better peak of what NAMA were selling uh, to vulture funds. Uh, and uh, uh, there's actually a rule in Berlin uh, where certain properties have to be made available to the state before investment funds can buy them. And uh, I think it's something that we should look at here. Our local authorities should have ac had access to suitable, fit-for-purpose units that ended up in the hands of vulture funds. A number of those points that deputies have made are more points that will come up in our deliberations for recommendations and some more questions. And Mr Jordan, specifically, in, when you are replying, Deputy O'Dell spoke about, um, you know, when, when a property is put on the market, generally speaking, the tenants are requested to vacate. Um, I notice you had said in one of your recommendations was to establish legal safeguards. So, in other words, that the property could be sold with the tenant, and that's that's the norm in the commercial sense. That commercial properties, if they have, if you have a 
a lease for a period of time. It's sold tenant not affected, and you'll see the signs on the tenant. What, if any, are the legal impediments to doing exactly the same with the residential side? Um, there are no legal impediments, actually. Um, it's just custom and practice, actually, in the residential sector to sell with vacant possession. In fact, we've come across situations where uh, tenants are being put out. Now, as it turned out, they're on fixed-term leases, and receivers have had no problem selling those properties on. I think there was four or five properties in one development with tenants in situ to a willing buyer. So this has to change. I, I totally agree. Uh, the tenants should be allowed to remain in the property, particularly where that, that property is being sold again into some sort of rented situation. In other words, that there isn't a person moving into the property. That really needs to be looked at um, because, you know, one of the, the reasons those regulations were introduced last year is because uh, lower paying tenants maybe in receipt rent supplement were being bumped out in favour of higher paying tenants. So I think there has to be a stronger rule around moving on properties in terms of sale. Um, I think the other thing is that in relation to, I know the issue was mentioned about rent certainty in the current market, and I know the Minister has said at another conference this morning that while he's sympathetic to those, he, he doesn't think he, he will be able to introduce it in the current dysfunctional market. I think then we have to look at the only thing that's going to impact on rents is supply. Now, one of the things that has come up recently is the idea of a purpose-built student accommodation. I do think that students could be taken out of the mainstream private rented sector. Very often it doesn't work for them because they're there for nine months of the year. Uh, they sign up to a one-year lease and then they lose their deposit. Uh, it's something that could be done very rapidly, and I think firewalling students against the mainstream private rental market is a good thing. I think if any Section 50 type break was introduced again, it would need to be linked to affordable rents for students, because one of the things that really dismays me is the fact that um, universities around the country have essentially followed the private rented market in putting up rents. Uh, that's totally inappropriate. It's a different market, but certainly that would be one way of freeing up supply. Obviously, there has been talk about, I, I know that... Um, Minister for Finance was in talking about the Living City initiative and doing something similar in rural areas. Obviously, there hasn't been huge take-up, but obviously there are spaces, I see them all over Dublin 7 where I am, uh, above commercial properties that could be used for the private rented sector. I think the main impediment tends to be issues to do with, in relation to fire safety and planning, but I think those things are, are surmountable. In the absence of the Minister doing anything else other than the rent freeze, then we have to look at supply. Uh, I think there are possible measures. I, I think the other thing, to, just to be said, is the home renovation incentive was extended to both homeowners and to landlords. Obviously, people are homeowners are extending their properties. Should be encouraged to do so to take more people on, on, under the rent room scheme. Uh, and obviously, landlords should be encouraged to extend their properties as well. And probably not. I mean, there has been good take up of the home renovation incentive, but maybe you know that could be looked at even more. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, Deputy Function. Thanks, Chair. First of all, I just want to say I deal with a lot of people that deal with threshold and they always find your service excellent and very professional and a lot of times people are in very difficult circumstances so it's good to to, um, to have a service as yourselves. Um, I also want to welcome your comments about rent certainty in relation to the landlords because I think that does get forgotten about. A number of years ago, at the start of the downturn, it, I think it was very handy for a lot of landlords to rely on the REST scheme because it was guaranteed rent. Now that things are, as they see, see it, kind of on the up, they're pulling out of the REST scheme and that's part of the problem and part of the reason we have such a, a difficulty. I just have one question and it's in relation to your um, the submission. It's uh, on under Section 5, the more security and protection from eviction. Um, recommendation 9, um, which isn't the Chair touched on, to introduce legal safeguards. Um, has that ever been put forward by threshold to the Department in the past uh, for as possible legislation? I'm just wondering if so, what was the response you got to it? Thank you, Deputy. I'll come back to you in a moment. I'll take it back up. Deputy Coppinger. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> just, uh, <clears throat> I welcome your. your comments about the kind of legislation and changes that are needed to protect people in the private rented sector. And uh, I just, I'm going to confine my remarks to the private rented sector rather than modular housing, which is nothing to do with yourself. Um, just the, the majority of social housing units on page eight of your report, you say, is going to be sourced still in the private rented sector. And I think that this is something this committee needs to take on board, that the private rented sector is an insecure place that's leading to homelessness. And yet, 
most of the increased social units are still situated in the private rented sector. Now, do you have an idea of how, how much? Because in the government's figures, they say 75,000 will come from the private rented sector <clears throat> and 35,000 from public. But actually within the 35,000, some of those are still leased, so they're still from the private rented sector. So um, would you agree that this is a policy that needs to completely change? Um, because your report nails the absolute lie that the private rented sector can provide security for people when it's based on, on profit. I wanted to ask you about overholding. Overholding is a tenant staying in a property beyond the, their termination date. Um, according to the RTB, in 2013 to 14, this increased by 50%. So, how many people do you see becoming homeless because of uh, termination notices, rather than rent increases, even? Um, would you uh, have any figures on that? And can I just ask you about overholding? Because we, I'm sure other TDs too, but I certainly, this is the biggest issue that people contact me for advice about. Um, and I totally understand that Threshold can only advise people to stay within the law. I understand that, and your website's very good for pointing people to. But there's a limit to what you can do. So w would you agree with me that people face overholding or homelessness? that that is now their choice. And as public representatives, I, I certainly have had to advise people, stay in the property, you have to overhold. And now I'm advising people to, to do that because I'm not going to be responsible for ringing the council three days later, looking for non-existent accommodation for somebody who voluntarily left a property. And I advise them to continue paying their rent. Now I know you're not in that position, but would you agree with me that's the only choice people have? Just quickly as well about how much are families paying off their income in private rent, um, if you had any, uh, and what impact do you see that having on people's lives? Uh, we, we'll be talking to the department soon about top-up payments. Threshold research says half of all tenants are paying top-up payments to landlords. The one family group found three quarters of lone parents are having to do this. Um, would you have any idea? And then. Just lastly, on this issue of security of tenure, because this now, as well as rent increases, to me is the biggest problem because landlords are using a legal mechanism to get rid of people. Sometimes it is to sell the property, but more often it isn't. And um, I've seen landlords, I'm sure you must get calls, maybe you could fill people in, resorting to all sorts of tactics, like literally painters moving in, decorators moving in while the family is still in situ to pressurise them to get out. Um, text messages arriving on the property, all sorts of subtle means to get rid of people and causing huge stress on people. Um, for security of tenure, you advocate that there has to be laws introduced to, like in the commercial sector, people would stay in situ even if the ownership changes. How would you see that working? Um, like, how does it work in the commercial sector? Just maybe you could draw that out for people here. But also, rent decreases. My information is that NAMA has succeeded in getting rent decreases in the commercial sector for 99% of the applicants. Just thought you might find that interesting, um, because I think we need rent decreases for tenants, but there doesn't seem to be any way uh, that that's forthcoming, except by legislation. Um, so, would you have any idea on what benefit that would have if people got it? Um, so, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Deputy, and Deputy O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, just, uh, just a couple of questions, one or two have been asked already. Um, the student accommodation, um, and you're Dublin 7, so you know that there are concerns from the communities there about this massive influx of students coming in and the effects that that will have on, on the communities there. Um, and I've also been hearing stories of landlords who have had tenants for a number of years, not in great, you know, in adequate accommodation, but have now told those tenants they have to leave because they are subdividing what was a, an adequate bedroom, whatever, 
into two units for students because students will take that. So I think that's another aspect that while we see get students out of that main rental sector, but this is an unintended consequence that that is happening. You mentioned in your presentation you prevented 8,550 from becoming homeless. You might explain um, how and was it all to do with increasing the rent supplement? Now we know that the rent supplement need, does need to be linked with whatever cost of living or consumer price index, but how do you balance that with the exorbitant rent increases that some landlords are imposing? And I've seen <coughs> unbelievable rent increases for people who are living in extremely meagre accommodation and the rent increase has been just incredible and there's a part of me that just hates landlords getting that increase because they're not improving the accommodation. The third one is again is tenants who are afraid to complain about the conditions they're living in, that something might need repair, might need repainting because they're afraid that this is going to give an excuse to the landlord to evict them. And the last one is, are you finding, with some of the tenants who are coming to you in Dublin, an interest in moving outside of Dublin because we have been discussing the Rural Resettlement Scheme? Thank you. Sullivan, Mr Jordan, would you like to address some of those issues? I would, yeah. Um, in terms of the sale of property, um, I suppose the measures that were introduced at the end of last year were, I suppose, on the basis that we had lobbied around the fact that the um, provisions in the Act around a landlord's intention to sell the property or moving a family member into a home or being abused. Uh, it was coming up quite regularly. I mean, we came across properties that, you know, where the landlord had purported that it was for sale and then the tenant had discovered that another tenant had moved in a few weeks later. So obviously these measures haven't been uh, run by the department yet, but it's going one step further and saying basically sale of the property uh, under most circumstances should not be a reason to put a tenant out. In fact, there's a lot of people out there who would be delighted to have somebody who's paying rent from day one, who's been recruited into the property by somebody else and has a track record of paying their rent. I mean, it's sort of counterintuitive to want to get them out of the property uh, when they're there ready, willing and paying. Um, absolutely. Well, obviously, you know, that's why we're talking about like rent certainty underpins everything that we're talking about here um, in terms of people's tenancies and that that would be and that's a very good reason why a tenancy should be continuing beyond sale because if the tenancy comes to an end there's an opportunity to increase that rent to market rent again that's why having an enduring tenancy is really important um, in terms of the proportion, I think, Deputy Coppinger, you talked about the, the, the proportion. I mean, the big footnote to the social housing strategy is that most of it is going to be delivered in the private rented sector. Uh, Threshold is on record as saying that there needs to be, we're accepting that one third of households going forward will need some support, uh, state support. They're going to be in the rented sector, either social rented or private rented, that there needs to be a rebalancing of social rented and private rented. At the moment, social rented is about 9%. We've said that it should be brought up to about 15%. 15%. We should at least have a 50-50 kind of situation. Now, but it looks like the private rented sector will continue to grow. Unless you can give people the kind of security or close to it in the private rented sector that you give people in social rented, then clearly a lot of people don't belong there. And certainly our experience in Threshold is that there are people living in the private rented sector who simply shouldn't be there, can't cope there. And equally, there are people in the private rented sector who have legitimate aspirations to own their own home and they need to be helped as well. Um, in terms of overholding, I mean, the issue with overholding is that when people remain in a property um, beyond the end of the tenancy, uh, to some extent you're making, it, you're making uh, a problem for the landlord which is really a problem of the state. That tenancy will ultimately crumble. Um, the tenant will eventually have to find alternative accommodation. So what we've said in this submission is this where, and as you quite rightly pointed out the numbers of overholding disputes that are going to appear to be, or the RTB as they're called now, that if, if you know, that tenant essentially has a bona fide problem with finding something else, then it needs to, there needs to be a protocol between the RTB and the local authority, and it's the local authority's problem to find people alternative accommodation, either directly or through an NGO or whatever, but those people shouldn't end up in a situation where they end up in homeless services for the lack of alternative accommodation. Our experience is that where people overhold, eventually it does crumble and they end up, so it's better to deal with the problem directly, and it, it's more the state's problem than it is the landlord's problem. Um, in terms of top-ups, 
I mean, as far back as 2005, I remember we published a report in 2005 in Cork that showed that 20% of tenants, even back then, were paying top-ups in the private rented sector. The issue and the reason we have a family homelessness crisis since 2013 is that even if some tenants paid all of their welfare to a landlord, they still wouldn't be able to meet the rental payment. And that's the issue. The issue has become uh, a situation where people have been managing their own poverty for years to, ones to one where they can't even manage their own property. And it's Threshold's experience that tenants will go to the ends of the earth to pay their rent. They'll do that above anything else, above food or, or you know, uh, looking after their children or going to the GP or anything else. They will do anything to pay their rent. So clearly there's a real crisis that is, is out, of, out of control there for them. Um, Deputy O'Sullivan, a number of remarks. Um, when I was referring to student accommodation, I was very clearly saying that it should be on-campus, purpose-built student accommodation that takes students out of the mainstream market. Students require a particular type of accommodation, they're required for a particular period of time, and it should be affordable. Um, and there's an opportunity there to do that. The Section 50 tax break that was introduced a number of years ago was actually one of the most successful tax breaks of all. I, I think What's happened, though, in recent years is that on-campus accommodation has become as expensive as it is in town, so there's no benefit to it. And I think any measure that's being introduced around student accommodation needs to make sure that it's priced at, a, at, at an affordable rent for students and, let's face it, their parents. Um, in terms of preventing people from coming homeless, it's not only about the protocol, although it's mostly about the protocol. Um, we negotiate with landlords. Some landlords, when you explain the, ten the tenant's position, are willing to leave the rent the same. That's got to be acknowledged. Um, some landlords, you know, where they issue invalid notice of termination, you know, we can buy the tenant maybe extra time in order to find an alternative accommodation. Some tenants have got local authority accommodation along the way. But one thing is very clear from this service, and it's, it's a second best option, is that if you give people more money under rent supplement, they don't become homeless in the main. So the question is, why wouldn't you do that across the board? Now, one of the issues around the rent supplement scheme is that, and it's been said widely, is that if you increase rent supplement across the board, you just inflate rents for everybody. Uh, but the problem with the rent supplement scheme at the moment is that it's a bit of a blunt instrument. I mean, essentially, there's, there's kind of one rate, more or less one rate, for all of Dublin. Now, all of us here know that rents are very different within different sub-markets within Dublin. The peer to be rent index is accurate to a level of 30 properties. So what we need to do is make sure that rent limits are not as visible to landlords. Landlords, really, it's none of their business where tenants get their money from, nor indeed how much they get. And it needs to be much more invisible to the landlord how much support a tenant is getting so that we get the best value in the market. But we've also said in the past that why shouldn't the Department of Social Protection just bargain directly with landlords and actually get a good deal? There's lots of landlords out there you know, who are making significant money out of the rent supplement scheme, and why not, you know, do some a little bit, uh, get some economies of scale around that. Um, in terms of people being afraid to complain, I think you're absolutely right about that. I think people are afraid to make contact with their landlord in any way at all. Um, and that's why organisations like ourselves are really important. And the proof of that, I think, is that one of the biggest issues we're still dealing with is substandard accommodation in the private rented sector. The non-carrying out of repairs, you know, I have the figures here last year. In 2014, it was 1,800 people came to us, 1,400 in 2015. That's really the tip of the iceberg. Um, in terms of people moving outside Dublin, a lot has been said about that. Our experience is that people have tried that out, but, and for some people it's worked, but for a lot of people it hasn't. And the reason it hasn't is because they've moved too far away from their family support networks. I mean, you know this better than I do, that when, if they don't have the support of their extended family, that it doesn't quite work out. So need to move very carefully around uh, a rural resettlement scheme. Um, I think Deputy Coppinger asked about the commercial sector. It's actually a very good question about, you know, um, I suppose the thing about the commercial sector is that people have long-term leases and therefore uh, the property is sold because the tenant, uh, the tenant has a 35-year lease or whatever. In the private rented sector, obviously you don't have 35-year leases anymore. Uh, but I think if we give people indefinite security of tenure um, and I suppose the right to remain in the property um, after it was sold, then it would be something of the equivalent. I can't tell you how you could drive down rents in the private rented sector by any other measure other than increasing supply at the moment. I think it's a very tricky issue that will probably 
dare I say it, probably would run into constitutional problems. It's probably the one thing that would. But I mean, um, if all of these other measures were implemented, things would improve considerably for people. And just to say, final comment, in terms of the homeless uh, problem, <coughs> there's a huge focus, obviously, on the provision of emergency accommodation, and that's, you know, uh, that prevents people from being on the streets. But actually, the focus, the rebalancing of uh, the homeless situation needs to focus on preventing people from becoming homeless at all costs and moving people as quickly as possible out of homelessness. Uh, Minister Coveney has increased the number of rapid build units, I think, from 500 to 1,000. Obviously, it needs to be much more than that. But the relentless focus should be on preventing people from becoming homeless and moving people on. Otherwise, the numbers in emergency accommodation is only going to continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. The, fi <coughs> the final series of questions. Uh, Deputy O'Rourke. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Bob, and thanks for all your, your help uh, with the different uh, tenants uh, down through the, the, the years. I suppose the number of points to make and maybe questions just to ask you to comment on. <coughs> One of the main reasons, and we know this, for homelessness is there's no activity in construction through the private or public sector, and that's the real problem. And one thing we'd like to see coming out of this committee and not prejudging its outcome is that that needs to be actioned and we need to improve supply absolutely urgently. And I know you're not here to comment on the rapid build. I wouldn't share the view about rapid build, as my colleagues would, because I've, I think that has already demonstrated <coughs> the cost is way in excess of what you would build a conventional property for. And this needs to be taken on board. And secondly, the actual uh, lifespan uh, and the actual longevity of them would be a concern also. And the construction time is not proven to be any faster than your conventional build uh, and that would be a concern and we needn't while there is a massive crisis and, and it is a crisis and we need to have supply and when we have supply it will it'll deal with all of the issues that we're all speaking about here this morning. We, if we have an e-jerk reaction we're going to be back here having a discussion in hindsight and we should have learned from that so that's hugely important. I think it's also Tenant protection is absolutely vital, and I think for all of the landlords in the private rental market that does excellent work, there is a minority.